Okay, so I would like to invite the speakers to um, come to the panel at this point, and we will do our. So I would ask you to introduce yourselves um, when you ask a question, and I invite you to ask um, concise questions as well. Uh, you can you can address your question to one or two members of the panels, or or just one specific panel member. Totally up to you. Um, do we have any questions, sir? Dan, I'm Dan Silverstein. I'm a strategic advisor uh, in private sector and capital markets. Danielle, I would direct my question to you. How do you tax the informal food sector? I was hoping we were going to do a round so I could <laughs> come up with some good answers. Um, well, to be honest, actually, a lot of these um, vendors are already taxed. Um, so um, I'm using the term vendor broadly, but it encompasses both market workers as well as your kind of street hawkers as well. Um, and so market workers in particular, they're already paying a tax to work in their stalls. Um, sometimes they pay it to multiple authorities. They may have to pay it to the market chairperson or market chairwoman, as the case in some West African countries, as well as to municipal authorities. Street hawkers usually have to pay some type of uh, some type of daily fee in order to you know, to kind of congregate in, in a particular area of the city. Um, and I think I mean I think there's a misperception that they don't contribute uh, taxation. Yeah. Yeah, because there, there's been some interesting work um, by WIEGO that uh, stands for Women in the Informal Economy, Globalizing and Organizing. Um, they have been actually working, I think, in four countries, including Ghana, South Africa, India, and I believe Peru, um, to actually do informal sector accounting. So particularly in the marketplaces, uh, basically going through the accounting with getting interviews with how much do these market workers and vendors actually pay on, on a daily basis to authorities. And they have some pretty surprising findings in the share that they're actually contributing. Next question, sir. My name is uh, Willis Oloj Kosura from the University of Nairobi, Kenya. <coughs> I'm glad each one of you acknowledged the, the importance of having good data to analyze these issues. My question is, to what extent are the organizations interested in investing in data collection and analysis? Uh, this is because our national governments are lethargic, if you like, in investing in this particular important area. I will take one more question. Okay, well done. Schengen, would you like to answer that? Uh, well, from a we do conduct a lot of household service in some of our country strategy support programs, Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, Bangladesh, and so on. So traditionally, we connect the data in rural areas focusing on uh, either production or the expenditures. So now I think in the future, we needed to also identify whether that household is in rural areas or urban areas. Obviously, the definition is a problem, but at least we will have some basic information. I think in Ethiopia, we probably we we actually can disaggregate that into rural and urban areas, but we must continue to do that. But I think FAO probably needs to do more uh, in and the World Bank. The World Bank. I don't know whether whether will will be able to speak on the World Bank. I think. We must do better than that. Just to add the urban module into the existing survey, or maybe separate the house into rural and urban. Uh, just to add to that, that yes, uh, there's no denying the fact about the importance of data. And FAO is committed, and FAO stats uh, works very hard. And one of our jobs is exactly what you mentioned, to enthuse national governments to leave their lethargy behind and start generating credible data and sharing that data. 
it's not just generational data. We have instances of governments not even sharing the data uh, with all and with agencies. So that's also something, uh, as I said, that uh, uh, that is the chaotic part of our work, the chaotic national government work where we move in and try and enthuse governments to share data. But uh, there's no taking away from the fact that unless you have hard data, credible data, evidence, uh, policies will falter. So it's very important there. Let me take, uh, sorry, let me take a, a slightly provocative uh, attitude to this issue. I think the issue of data collection will be over in the next 20 years, in the sense that we will have far more ways of collecting data automatically than we have today. This may seem far-fetched, but I think this is going to be with us quite soon. Uh, that's not to say that national governments and international organizations don't have a role to play, but if you see what is already possible in terms of scanning the Earth's surface, in terms of what crops are grown, when they are planted, how much water is used, how much fertilizer is used, what the uh, flows of food and products will be, uh, and even based on the data, you can quite accurately assess how much the yield is going to be. I'm not saying that, that this is going to be easy, and it raises an issue um, of enormous amount of data, but I think our concern probably in the future will be not the lack of data, but the amount of data and how to process it, and who has access to what data. Important companies today, such as Monsanto, for example, um, through acquiring, uh, for example, the Climate Corp, are actually converting themselves from a seed and agricultural inputs company to a data company. And I think that is a trend that we see in the private sector that governments haven't really uh, come to terms with. So the data issue is, will be far more complex, but in some ways will be resolved. And the only issue, I mean, not a small issue, but the only issue will be, will be who has access to the data, who has the control, and how can it be used to really create sustainable food production. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I'll come back to you, ma'am. Um, I work in impact evaluation at Social Impact. Um, my question is about this term integration. And so we hear it a lot within this presentation. And I recently read a World Bank blog post that claimed that integration is the new black <laughs> in development. So I'm just wondering, um, when you say like, integration of value chains or different systems. Are we talking about integration between different organizations who do similar things or like financial integration or is it integration of services? Just wondering if you could go into a little bit more detail about what we mean in this context in terms of integrating systems. Okay, and sir? Yes, hi, uh, Ben Reinhardt from uh, DAI. Um, We've heard for a while now that um, urban, understanding urban food insecurity seems like a very difficult, um, a difficult subject to get around. It's, it's been a while now that you know, we have systems for understanding and measuring um, and predicting rural food insecurity, but urban food insecurity uh, still seems a challenge. And yet for years there have been attempts to better understand livelihoods there, better understand consumption patterns, markets, and so forth. But this is general for the panel. What do you think are the biggest um, constraints or problems that we have to really understanding, measuring the, uh, the scale and the causes of food insecurity in urban areas? What's been sort of holding us back? Perhaps we can start at the other end with Elizabeth. Sure. Um, so just two thoughts on that. Um, well, so first on the integration, I think it's a great question. And Unfortunately, I think that the answer is kind of everything. I think that we need to see integration across so many different um, areas, whether that be sectors, whether that be types of businesses. And I'll give one example just from the policy point of view. Um, I talk a lot, and we talked a lot during Habitat 3 about policy integration. So horizontal policy integration, which means that we need the transportation department to talk to the development department, to talk to the ag department. So across all of those sectors, so that if you think about it, if we really want to have some coordinated policy on food, it needs to involve all of those sectors. So that horizontal integration, but then also there's the vertical policy integration which is really important too so how is the national government talking to the local government how are local governments talking to each other a lot of times one thing that we I haven't we haven't talked about yet today is that 
one of the things that can be difficult about the rural urban spectrum is that you're crossing lines, you're crossing jurisdictions. So how do those policies talk to each other? How does that funding talk to each other? So that's one of the ways I think about integration, um, but I think that that answer could have many others as well. Um, and then on the, the data and how do we actually measure it, I think one of the things that has been um, really true to me as I look at this over and over again is that, and I'm not sure that this really answers the question, but just a thought, is that for me, food insecurity and, and food insecurity in urban areas is often a measure of income because uh, people who are in urban areas are purchasing their food. So that's why that purchasing power is so important. And so I think that um, that then gets to income, employment, all of that, social protection. So I think that that is a way to at least solve the problem, if not maybe measure it. Uh, okay, um, I think in terms of integration, well, I think uh, as um, Enable said, that's it's, it's almost everything. But I wanted to emphasize two things. One is policy. The food policy either is either dis defined by agricultural rural areas or by the urban areas. Traditionally, it's by agriculture, by uh, rural areas, but gradually, particularly the urban agenda. You know, they wanted to look at urban food security. But the solution is wrong. Let's say the mayor of Shanghai said, oh, we are going to produce 20 to 30 percent of the food we need. But meantime, 100 kilometers away, like in my hometown. My hometown is two hours away from Shanghai. But they never tried to talk to my the city governor. I said, hey, can we work together to solve the food nutrition security problem? I mean, this is the general trend, and not some mayors try to solve the problems by setting up the highly automated mechanized food factories in Singapore. I think I wanted to make their vegetables, eggs production, or eggs consumption self, well, 30% self-sufficient. Is this the right way? If you consider the climate change impact, greenhouse gas impact, and probably in the future also certain animal diseases, because they are very close to humans. Mm -hmm. Then on data, I think, we do connect the data in urban areas. Yes, expenditure survey, I remember, right? And we also have certain data on child stunting, health side. But what we do not have is their diet. <coughs> what, what do city people eat? No. Do we have that? We don't. So they either eat too much or too less, or this and that. You know, the income, as you know, <laughs> income is very poor proxy for nutrition or even for health. So we needed to build that module, the, uh, the food, food consumption by, by let's say, household, household members and look at their diet pattern. Um, Vim Lendra first and then Danielle. Yeah. Oh, just to add on to that, I'll, I'll, on the integration part, uh, I'll agree with both uh, Elizabeth and Shing in that uh, uh, it, it has to be a uh, integration across uh, sectors, uh, whether it's financial or social or governance or whatever. I'll just give you a small example. Uh, I have in my career with the Indian government been the head of uh, a very large municipal corporation in Maharashtra, Nashik. I've headed that corporation for three years. Now, I will admit that in three years of my heading the municipal corporation of a city which is about seven million people, I never thought of food. That word never came in my thinking at all. And from there you can understand how disjointed governance is because I never looked outside the boundary of my city. And food was supposed to be a rural issue being grown in villages and transported to the city and being sold in markets. So that's coming from a personal experience. I, I understand it was my failure and I'm willing to accept that. Because now after Coming into this arena and understanding this sector, I realize how wrong I was. But that is the truth, and that is a hard truth which is facing most of the urban areas in many parts of the developing world. So you have some fantastic examples we heard of, heard from the Baltimore people yesterday who are really thinking in terms of food. You have the Milan Pact and all that. But that's, again, let me tell you, just, uh, just beginning to grow majority of the urban areas still think food is rural 
and we are not concerned with it. So I think it's a very important thing that we integrate all these uh, I think thought processes for data. Uh, I, uh, I'm uh, aware of the fact that when we say that half the population is living in urban areas and this is going to uh, go up to two thirds, you have to understand the basic uh, issue underneath that you are moving two thirds of the population away <coughs> from the place where they produce. So when you move two thirds away from where they are producing, that means two thirds are purchasing. And two thirds purchasing brings ties in very neatly with what you're saying about income levels. What is the purchasing power of the urban poor. How many months a year do they have work? Do they have regular work? Do they have capacity to save for the rainy day? Issues of malnutrition in many parts of urban areas, especially also in the richer parts, transitioning from micronutrient deficiency now into uh, <coughs> huge concerns around obesity. We just heard that 60% of the world's population is not eating right, even if they're eating. They're not eating right. And much of it is also now concentrated in the urban areas. How do you measure that? How do you analyze that? How do you put policies in place for that? So these are huge uh, uh, issues around which adequate data will need to be gathered, analyzed, and evidence created for policymakers to be satisfied that they need to really come in very heavily and put in the right policies in place. Thank you. Danielle and then Louis. Yeah, I just wanted to um, also respond to, to Ben's question about the difficulty of getting a handle on, on urban food security. And I think it's linked to the two definitional issues we've talked about already. I think one, I think because food insecurity in the urban sector also involves the concern about obesity as well, that you may not be looking at in the rural area. And so I think when we're often looking at the income expenditure surveys, we're looking at kind of the shortfall and people being able to meet that food basket, for example. We're not looking at the, you know, are they going over and the micronutrient um, components of what they're consuming. Um, and then I think this issue of what's urban, um, the subnational variation is pretty large. So um, I do think there, there are specific definitions of urban and rural if you look at national censuses. So if you, Ghana, it's 5,000 people, right? But what you're going to see in Accra of 2 million people is going to be different in, uh, you know, in a secondary town or city of, of 5,000 people. The cost is going to be higher in Accra, um, and also the, the access to different foods is going to be different. And so I think trying to get a national perspective on what's actual urban food security, taking into account all, all the different price points um, and access to, to foodstuffs is where, where we get the difficulty. I think one, one other dimension which lies below all this is we can spend a lot of effort on data, um, but when and the way data and integration are linked, I think the, the fundamental issue is that nowhere in education, particularly primary and secondary education, are young children or young adults taught about the fact that food comes from a food chain and that there is, by definition, if you are a consumer, you have to be an integrated thinker. And, and so this idea of where our food comes from doesn't exist in our school curricula, which to me, if you think about it, is very strange. We learn about history, we learn about geography, and we don't learn about the single most important thing for our own survival, but also for the survival of civilizations, and that is food. So I'm a great uh, advocate of getting that integrated thinking, including integrated thinking about data, right there in education, and have a sort of compulsory course on the food chain in our country, in our community, in the world, and how it has to do with development full stop. I think if we can get that, and as that means policy integrating, mm -hmm. integration and ministries of education involved in, in getting the policy, we'll have a big change in a generation from here. I'll take the two questions from this side first, sir, and then you. The microphone. Yeah, my question would point uh, would Could you relate. introduce yourself, sir? Sorry, my name is uh, Oliver Kirui from Center for Development Research at University of Bonn in Germany. Um, your presentation, Elizabeth, towards the end, you mentioned about exploiting the interdependencies between the rural and the urban um, sectors. And also, Schenken, in your first presentation, you talked about the, the bigger proportion of food consumed in the, the, uh, the African cities or in the urban centers in the African countries is perhaps rise from 
say, Vietnam or Pakistan and the wheat from Central Europe. So my question really is about, um, is which is more important? Is it, are we looking at production and, and enhancing that through marketing and getting this to the markets in Africa? Or we are thinking about making the productive, I mean, uh, making uh, the markets work so that people are able to purchase food. African countries now stressing on the service industry and the expansion of the manufacturing. So particularly people are given more purchasing power and they can buy food from the markets. Are we talking about more protectionist approach? Or are we talking about um, making people able to purchase their food? Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much, um, Rajul from IFPRI. Um, Louise, I want to follow up on the conversation you started and to marry that with the comment of uh, Liz earlier on. This is uh, bringing food into urban planning. And I was curious, from your perspective of university, do urban, how do you integrate the curricula at, at, at that level, how do urban planners think and talk about food? And this is also picking up on Wim Lendra's point, you know, they didn't even think about that. So I'm very curious, and I'm also very curious, where does health come into this? Because of the concentration also in urban areas, density of people and of animals and so forth. And you mentioned animal protein, so I was very curious about that. How do we change this whole discourse how do we bring different people together and what is the role of university in terms of being this bridge, uh, of providing that bridging capacity? Thank you. So we'll go ahead. Anyone like to Louise? Okay. You want me to go? Yes. First? Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> There's so many questions. Uh, I think that's, a, that's, of course, a very valid set of questions from both of you. Um, we need to now look at cities, selected cities, as a kind of living labs. We, were, we have to try out things. I don't think there's one blueprint approach. Cities are cities, but they're also very diverse in terms of nearly every dimension that you can think of. Uh, we are working with MIT here in the US uh, and the city of Amsterdam to try and, and do something which we call urban pulse, which actually involves also citizens in tracking some of the uh, food chain related issues, but that can also be wastewater, uh, heat stress in the city and so on. And by engaging citizens, you actually get some of the educational effects because we cannot wait for a whole curriculum change. It, of course, at university level, our university can teach and does teach students in an integrated way, but not everybody goes to Wageningen. So in the meantime, all those who don't, do not go have to be trained in some way. So I'm, a, I'm in favor of making a specific plan for every single city looking at an integrated policy approach using it as a little, little living lab and trying out different approaches different ways for example also of how you organize markets how you get the health dimension in fact health is very often an issue which is easier for people to grasp than food and the connect connection between food and health both in terms of infectious diseases zoonotic diseases and chronic diseases is very easily made so you can get then subsets of the city to be involved and it's very important we didn't address this but cities of course are huge so you cannot deal with a city as a whole you have to think about decentralizing it and breaking it up in different parts that's already true for the supply chain but it's definitely also true for policy and i think one of the really interesting follow-up uh, things that we could do from this kind of work collectively is compare different approaches to cities and see how they have resolved things. Um, whether a centralized or a decentralized approach works better, how can you actually involve people? I, I, I think this is a, uh, an area where something that we now call citizen science is going to be really attractive, involving people directly in giving solutions shaping the future. To give you one, one small example, then I'll stop. Um, we actually encourage people to collect the insects on the windscreens of their cars and send them in. And through the insect density and, and frequency, we can actually tell something about what harmful insects could be there that actually attack crops. It's very nice, it's very neat, every school kid can do it. And if you give the feedback to people through the mobile phones, which of course are far more frequent in cities, um, you actually get an interaction 
And there are lots of subjects that lead themselves to these very concrete types of involvement. And I think that's even better than waiting for people to go to university. Every year, Africans are importing $40 billion of foods. And most of these foods are consumed by urban city residents. So there is a lost opportunity to link smallholders around the city. Like what will be the solution? One is, I think the city citizens must change their perception that well, they think the processed rice, wheat, and nutritious, healthy food. But actually, it's opposite. So that perception must be changed. I think the access to the foods, vegetable foods, from informal markets, from wet markets, probably a, a much better, and it's equally good of, um, as the imported foods. That's one. Secondly, part, yeah, I think, as I said, the value chain is broken. So you, maybe roads are not there. Maybe the processing facilities are not there. A concrete experience is, is in Nigeria. So a study shows that well, the, the uh, rice consumers in Abuja, uh, in Lagos, they consume imported rice from Thailand, from, from Vietnam. In the meantime, the rice produced in Nigeria cannot be sold to the city because of poor quality, poor minimum facility. So one solution is to improve the processing facility, to improve the quality that can help to meet the urban demand. But the changing the perception is very important. I think uh, if we want to promote a more balanced diet, you know, locally produced fruits, vegetables, cassavas, you know, small animals are equally good, probably even better. I will take one more question from the gentleman in the back, um, and, then, and then we will wrap it up. Yeah. Yes. Actually, I am Amarinder Reddy from Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi. Uh, recently, we have done a survey on uh, no, Delhi slum dwellers and district vendors. Uh, there are some, you know, uh, these uh, problems. This mostly the consumers of the street vendors are migrants, casual laborers, unemployed, uh, and uh, they don't have very clean water, clean air, and you know, cleanliness is a big problem. And their the daily income is not more than two dollars per per day. So, in under those circumstances, how we can make this? We have to make. Th they are mostly they going for this uh, street vendors only for daily consumption and all these things. Again, street vendors also having multiple problems. Their legal status is not clear. The low turnover and food safety is very, very problem because they have to give, you know, serve, uh, you know just uh, half, a, you know, half a dollar meals or something like that. Again, the profits and uh, again, the cleanliness is a big problem. Under these circumstances, this is the ecosystem of the storm dwellers. Under this ecosystem, how we can, you know, what is the ways forward for increasing safety without increasing the cost to the consumers? And what are the you know, policy options like food government subsidies or food coupons, this type of thing? What are the best options? All right, great question. Um, do we have any? I think Daniel has already mentioned or, or proposed some solution certification mm -hmm. of the vendors. But I think uh, another important element is the general access to clean water, sanitation. I mean, unless you solve the water problem, you will not be able to, to solve the food problem, right? If, if, you're, if, you're, if you're dirty water to cook your food or dirty water to wash your dishes, then even your food is clean, nutritious, healthy, it's not going to happen. But certification is one way, but I don't know how you do that if the, most of the vendors are illiterate. Well, I mean, actually, that's uh, that's an open question. We found some in in Zambia. Actually, most of the vendors are university graduates, and they can't they can't find jobs. But it's different. Oh, right. It's different in Senegal, where where you you find yeah. a different. So it's it, that's country dependent. Um, I I mean, I think. You've hit on a really important issue, um, and I've been also kind of knocking my head about this too. I don't really, I gave some suggestions here. So a lot of them are small scale. You're not going to have kind of impact at scale with some of those suggestions. Um, but I think this is a, a real conundrum for um, obviously not just African, you know, global cities in terms of your most vulnerable populations. Maybe they are also migrants, newly arrived migrants. Um, how you are able to kind of 
harness their potential. You're not giving other job opportunities, um, but at the same time, you're kind of cracking down on their their behavior as well. So um, it's a great question. I can't say. Right. I but relatively speaking, I thought the uh, the Thailand street food is quite clean. Well, not perfect, right? I mean, I have not seen much food safety issues from Thailand. Maybe it's, there's a good lesson to learn from Thailand. Finlandra? Uh, just to add that, uh, uh, well, we have to remember that um, the informal sector is a very, very important provider of food to the urban poor. So uh, the answer is not what in many developing countries and cities which start feeling that, you know, the, the vendor is a, is a blot on the beauty of the city and therefore remove him from there. That's not the answer. The answer is to how do you make the street vendor, the vending of food on streets safe? And uh, whether it is Delhi or Bangkok or anywhere, it, it has to be a concerted effort by the local government of the area to ensure that you do not do away with this important link between food security and urban poor, but make this link uh, more effective, more healthy, and more safe. So there is a lesson there for the Delhi government uh, if it is not really acting on it. Thank you. Okay, well, um, so we've gone five minutes over time. I apologize for not being able to take further questions, but some of the panel members will stay here if you want to talk to them. Please join me in thanking them.